everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to another live q and I'm here with my fearless co-pilot, Alicia. How are you doing, Alicia? Doing well, Mark. It's finally starting to fall out in Alberta. We're getting some more sun. It feels a little bit like spring might be on its way soon. I know. I'm looking at the, the snow over this last week as it disappeared so fast. And the forecast was crazy. So it had been relatively below zero for probably a couple of weeks. And then I looked at the forecast and every single day was going to be at least 10 or above with, I know this weekend we're looking at 18 degrees Celsius, I think on Sunday down here in Lethbridge. So I was trying to figure out what am I going to do now? Because I've, I've been heavily into my ice fishing and uh, my ice is going to be all gone by the end of this week. So yeah, it's been a, a season of big swings. Like I think this winter has felt like it's either minus 20 and, you know, there's some snow, but it's minus 20 and minus 30 with wind chill. And then the other option is it's going to be like plus six. Like it's just been a very kind of crazy swing back and forth. So unfortunately, I've not been able to do a lot of cross country skiing because there's no snow or it's so cold that it's very hard to cross country ski when it's minus 30. Yeah. That's it. And I know you and your, your husband did a trek up into the mountains when the weather wasn't spectacularly warm. So yeah, uh, the, the kids too. Yeah. Everybody yeah. had their backpacks and we had the polk and we went up into, into the mountains and there's a backcountry hut up there. And it was, yeah, it was about minus 20 most of the time. And it was amazing at night. Um, I mean, you're back away from any of the city lights at all and you're in a nice dark zone. And so the stars, you could actually see the Milky Way. It's beautiful. Spectacular. That's awesome. Yeah. That is so, so wonderful. Great. Well, all of you who are tuning into the Canadian Immigration Live Q&A, welcome. If this is your first time here, we uh, take this opportunity to answer your questions about Canadian immigration. And if you're a repeat viewer, you'll know that uh, one of the best ways to get your question answered is to make it useful to as many people as possible. And when you're asking questions that are really specific, that are just about your unique circumstances, will very often ring. I wonder if I can get the, the right uh, little sound effect here. Oh, not that one. Right there, that little bell. And that indicates that's really something we should probably book a consultation. And uh, right, if, you were, uh, if you're wondering, okay, well, how do I connect with you guys if I want to retain your help, you know, hire you to help me with my application or just get some questions answered that are specific to me, you can easily just go to our website, click on Speak to a Lawyer, and voila. All right, so we also love to hear where you're tuning in from. So no matter where you are in the world, please post a comment and just give us a shout out. Let us know. Uh, we'll give a shout out here to Batman. It says, hi, Mark and Alicia visiting Calgary. Oh, let's get rid of our little intermediate little thing here. We'll get rid of our, our little, this one here. There we go. Um, so Batman says, um, I will uh, uh, visiting Calgary in April, second week. So excited to visit Banff. And Banff is a beautiful national park. You will really, really enjoy yourself there, Batman, that's for sure. Uh, shout out to Jay here who's connecting in. And uh, and if you're posting questions already, that's totally fine, not a problem at all. But uh, anyone who has any questions, you can go ahead and post them and we'll go through them systematically. But there's been a few developments, Alicia, hasn't there been? Um, one of the things that we are always talking about here within our Canada Immigration Live Q&A is express entry. And uh, if we slide over here, we'll see that there was a draw um, right here that occurred yesterday, and it was a general draw. And we've had lots of discussions with our clients what this is going to look like, what's the world is going to look like, how low the comprehensive ranking system score is going to drop to um, you know, in the future if someone is just applying based on their human capital. And we can see right here that the round yesterday, they did a fairly large one, 2,850, and it pushed the CRS score down to 525. Now, I know I have a client that this has resulted in that client getting an invitation to apply, uh, one that I just had a, a connection with just a couple days ago. Um, uh, but yeah, Alicia, is this surprising to you at all? I mean, it's. I think it's good news. We're out of the 540s at least. So that's pushed the CRS down to something that's 
almost maybe sometimes a little bit more reasonable. I mean, it's still so high, um, but at least we're coming down from the astronomical scores that it was for the last few months. So, you know, there's some hope at the end of the tunnel. I know there's a number of clients that, that I have that are waiting. They're above 500, but they're below 525. So they are hoping that that comes down just a little bit more. So we'll see what happens with this general CRS, but um, for sure, it's a super competitive world out there for express entry right now. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people were becoming a little frustrated with the frequency and number of French language draws. And the interesting thing, Alicia, I've always, like this is, this is perplexing to me, is that if individuals have higher human capital and they have French, they are invariably going to get drawn under these general draws in any event. But what we're seeing with the French language draws is the government saying, hey, we don't really care as much about the human capital of individuals as long as they speak French. Because even this score here, 336, if they are in the pool and they are qualifying, which I think this is a CL, I think this is NCLC 7 is what you need to meet. If you're hitting that level and you speak a little English, you're getting almost, well, 50, 60 points, maybe even 65 extra points. So when you look at this, this individual, the lowest ranking person was like 270 points. And so really the CRS scores for, for some of these candidates are really quite low. It's the French that's driving it up. And, uh, and so it, it's nice to see that there have been more general draws and obviously the frequency and the volume of these invitations is going to cause the CRS score to go down, and to drop. Mm -hmm. And so I think many people are, are really excited to see this is happening and that the world of category-based draws isn't completely driving the process. You can see there was a really large healthcare draw right here that pulled the CRS scores down to a reasonable level at 422. And remember, healthcare includes some pretty high human capital folks like doctors and and uh, and um, you know specialists and things like that. So, and if you take a look at that, Mark, when you're scrolling through, right, like the last general draw is 535 and then they did another general draw and it only went down one point right 534 but now because they've done one within two weeks and it was a relatively large draw yesterday that made it go down to 525 so if you're losing hope and if you have a profile out there and it needs to be updated or you need to make sure to get your profile in do it now because if they happen to do another draw right away and you are sitting over 500 there is a chance, depending on the timing of those general draws, that you might just kind of squeak in. So, yes. you know, try. And one thing, Alicia, now with, with how high the scores are, there was a time, you guys, when they only provided from 400 to 450. So they didn't actually provide this range breakdown. Um, all that we saw was between 400 and 450, and then it was everything above 450 that was lumped together. But with this, so many people, 10,000 people being in this range, I wish that they would release the breakdown like this, the 50-point breakdown, mm -hmm. uh, the 10-point 10, 10 uh, breakdown from 500 to 600. Because I, like you said, Alicia, the number of individuals, these 10,573 that are from, from basically 501 to, you know, you know, obviously like 520, I, mm -hmm. I have to assume there's probably six or 7,000 in that, in that category alone. Um, and that's how we can have that 525 and uh, at, with the round of invitations and uh, as, as being the low score and still have 2,850 people above that, that total. So just, uh, just some food for thought. But yeah, all in all, it's, it's relatively positive. But let's face it, Alicia, you know, there, is, there are so many international workers that are here in Canada right now that are simply not going to have a pathway to permanent residence. And um, one of the things that we don't yet, I don't think we have it scheduled just yet, is um, a special session that I'm doing with, um, <clears throat> with Ron Lee Carey. And that session is on humanitarian and compassionate applications. And what people are now looking at, and, and it's, it's really, really important that people be careful. And uh, let's see if we've got it scheduled. I don't know if we do yet. Let's see here. <clears throat> Not quite yet. 
but what the whoops here got things going on here on my screen as I'm searching. Um, the the most important thing that people understand is that um, you know if you get help as early as possible, you get some uh, you're, you're able to connect with uh, you know with us. The earlier if you if you're deciding, hey, I should really get some help to figure out what my future holds, it's far better to reach out to us as soon as possible in the process versus at the end. And Alicia, I can't tell you how many consultations I've had with people who have ultimately left it until they only have a few months left and then they come and book a consult and there's not much that that we can do to fix it. So um, yeah, so I just wanted to bring that up because it's a reality and uh, yeah, the time to book a consult is, is earlier in the process, not near the end. Okay, let's see who else we have here connecting in. Um, we'll give a few more shout outs. Uh, let's see. We've got Dev Smith. Hey, Mark and Alicia. Hi, Dev. Good to see you. And uh, let's see here. And we've got uh, Betalem. Yeah, Bet Betalem. Uh, hey, Mark and Alicia. All right. Okay, let's dive into some questions here. And if you have a question, please don't hesitate to post it. And we'll work our way through. Okay, Manu says, hey, Mark, I received my passport request within 53 days of AOR via EE. Oh, this is a good one. Big thanks to you and your team for the informative videos and live Q&As uh, that I followed over the past several months. Well, we def definitely can give a little round of applause there for, uh, for Manu. Thanks so much for sharing that, Manu. It's been our absolute pleasure. Okay, uh, Jay, next question is from Jay. He says, my work permit's expiring in July. And I have CLB5 and TEF and job offer. Am I eligible for French Mobility Work Permit Program? If yes, how long uh, does it take to approve work permits? So once again, Jay, I would recommend in your situation, this is exactly one of these, book a consult so that we can sort it out with you. But if you have CLB5 and all abilities, then you may be eligible for that uh, work permit through the Francophone Mobilité Program. So, yeah, and maybe um, Mark, you mm -hmm. you can find the the program requirements yeah. on Mobilité Francophone, because the good news is they actually loosened up a little bit of the stringent yeah. rules around Mobilité Francophone in terms of the NCLC levels that you have to have, as well as what kind of proof is going to constitute French language ability. And so it used to be that French had to be your your mother language, your langue maternelle, and that was very very clear from a lot of the material. But now they're saying, well, you know what? If you're applying after June 15th of last year, then as long as you're meeting general eligibility requirements for a work permit, you can't be going to Quebec. It has to be any province outside of Quebec. Um, and you can prove that you're hitting NCLC level five on everything, right? Speaking, reading, listening, and writing. And you have to have that proper employer offer through the employer portal. It's gotta be employer specific. Your company has to go through and pay that $230 employer compliance fee. They have to create an employer portal if they have not yet done so and have the company approved with their CRA business number. And then you've got to prove that you meet the requirements for Mobilité Francophone um, based on your, your language test scores. And so it does, I think, yeah, it gives some other feedback somewhere else on this page about what constitutes proof of French language ability. Yeah, yeah, once you get into that section. Um, but yeah, writing the test, having an actual TF or TCF that shows your your uh, your language abilities are in the range of a level five or higher on the NCLC scale, um, then yes, that may very well be a possibility for you, um, as long as your employer is willing to 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 work with you to do it, because the employer has to, like Alicia said, register the job offer in the employer portal before you can submit your work permit application. But that's very positive, Jay especially if your work permit's expiring in July. Very positive. All right. Okay, let's see if we can get uh, Prakvice here. BCG eligible. Mm, da, 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 da. Medical bio complete after confirming with RCC. No credit card dues during submission of application. I did not list credit card details and proof of funds. Now there are dues, which I am clearing. Will this be an issue? I'm not sure exactly what this question is. Um, I, okay, uh, I think maybe Prakvice is saying 
in their their proof of funds so when they were doing their express entry profile they didn't list their credit card liabilities um because at the time there wasn't credit card liabilities but now there are and so they're trying to figure out is that going to change settlement fund requirements if they have an ongoing express entry application i think that makes sense all right, Batman says, Mark and Alicia, my brother's PR application is in progress. Tracker shows eligibility not started. However, we connected with IRCC agent and she said eligibility completed. Can we not rely on the tracker? No, you can't rely on the tracker. Anyone who's relying on the tracker, you're wasting your time. It may be correct. It may not be correct. It's just not worth it. Save yourself the pain and suffering. Eventually, I'm hoping that the tracker will actually become effective but the tracker is only so effective as the officer on the other end who's updating it. And in some cases, officers don't update um, as frequently as they, as they should. And so what shows on the internal system isn't always reflected in your actual tracker. So Alicia, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but I've always said, I just, yeah, the trackers are not useful to me at all. They create more pain and suffering for people. In an ideal world, they would work. Um, I just wanted to jump back to Vice's question about proof of funds and if you have liabilities that change during the processing processing of express entry. If you are applying under FSW, you have that requirement to meet the settlement funds throughout. If you didn't have liabilities then, but you do now, and that substantively changed your accessible funds, it's possible that immigration could say, you know, do you have those settlement funds? Are they accessible? So that is always a um, ongoing concern. And so if you have concerns about whether you're still meeting your settlement funds, then for sure reach out and book a consult. You can go take a look at what IRCC says about maintaining settlement funds, because technically you have to have them at the time of application and at the time of determination of your, your file. So do be careful to make sure that you're always reaching that target level once you've done a subtract a subtraction of your liabilities and that if you have currency exchange issues you're making sure that you have enough in your assets that you can show even with currency exchange or fluctuations in in foreign currency and canadian that you have that settlement fund requirement yeah and this becomes a big issue like i have a client in iran and they can lose half of their settlement funds by putting it in a bank account like almost overnight. Mm -hmm. Um, There's such volatility and whether they're converting it to a U.S. dollar account, it doesn't even matter. So it's always a, a, a problem for people where you live in jurisdictions where the currency can really take high, you know, large swings. And so, um, lots of people ask, well, do I have to keep it in? Can I put it in and then take it out? And the reality is express entry is a very rigid system and officers uh, are, are really charged with the responsibility of processing things really, really quickly. And if anything doesn't line up perfectly with what they expect to see in an application, they just refuse. Or if it's at the early stages, they will return it as being incomplete. Now, like Alicia said, when are they really looking at settlement funds? Well, when you submit your EAPR after you get your ITA, you're going to submit your your bank your bank letter in accordance with those requirements. And Alicia, I was looking at a federal court case the other day where someone had submitted just bank statements, and the officer rejected, and the court upheld the refusal, which I thought was freaking insane, because how many banks actually are willing to uh, you know produce these letters? Personally, I think whoever counsel took that one to federal court didn't do a very good job because I think you can definitely fight and challenge uh, a rejection when you've done everything you can. The funds are legitimate, but the bank is doesn't have a branch that you can walk up to or has a policy of not issuing letters. And so these are all things that we cover in the Express Entry um, Accelerator, our 2024 course that teaches you how to do this. We talk about these challenges. We talk about these issues. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's hard when you're in a jurisdiction where you're afraid to leave it in because at the end, when the time comes to get your PR, you may have half the amount of funds that you originally put in all because you kept it in a bank account. So, um, you know, so at the end of the day, there's risks with whatever you do. Uh, when you submit your application, the officer is going to look at it. They have the ability to double check at any point in time throughout the application process. And if they see funds have, have dropped or you, they've been pulled out, Guess what an officer's going to think? 
they're going to think, is this really that person's funds or is it just show money? Which, oh my goodness, that's a term that just drives me crazy. Are they just getting a loan from someone else, putting it in their account and then pulling it out um, because it's not really theirs? Officers have the ability to, you know, to make reasonable decisions. And uh, on a balance of probabilities, if someone put money in an account and then took it out two days later, and that's what their bank account show, is it reasonable to say, well, I don't know if that money is really theirs. So you have to be careful. You have to make sure that you're, you know, you, you, any decision that you make to divert from the specific requirements of, the, of express, uh, express entry, you run a risk. So, and I'm not going to tell people what to do or, you know, how to sort things out because ultimately if they check at any point in time and now the funds have dropped because they're in a bank account, well, you're not going to be successful that way either. So you have to, you know, you have to make reasoned decisions and, and that those are the discussions that we have with our clients when we're going through this and within the course. Whew, that was a doozy. <laughs> we got all of that from a, a tracker. All right. Um, okay, here's a great one, Alicia. This is in your wheelhouse. I'll let you take on RK's question. Is it mandatory to declare an old legal name in the EAPR? What if we don't? <laughs> yes, you need to declare an old legal name in your EAPR. So if you have an application where it says, have you ever used another name? And if the answer is yes, then you need to say yes. And especially if it's a legal name, right? If you had, I don't know, a maiden name, a name that you were given at birth, and then you changed your name upon marriage, definitely you need to disclose what that old maiden name was, the, the name before marriage. And the reason is because immigration needs to go and do their background and security checks. And maybe somebody committed an offense or had a charge a criminal charge against them when they were under name number one and then they got married and now they're under name number two and so immigration's argument is going to be we can't do our due diligence we can't properly vet this person for admissibility if they don't tell us who they are what their identities have been if we can name check and, and cross check birthdays and other identity documents so yes it's mandatory if you don't do it, theoretically, immigration could say it's misrepresentation. You failed to disclose key information that prevents us from properly vetting the application. And of course, you never, ever want to be in a situation where you're getting that procedural fairness letter or there's a possibility that they can say it's misrepresentation. Section 40 of the Act, it's going to be a five year inadmissibility bar for you and your accompanying family members. So make sure that you're doing this properly. In some circumstances, you can explain why you failed to do it. You can correct it and make sure that you've put it in and updated your application. All right, let's dive into our next question. Daniela says, hi, Mark and Alicia. For a passport request, is the passport supposed to be sent in any VAC or they specify the one in the country where we live? Yeah, Daniela, so it used to be that under the Act, it was very clear that people had to send in their applications to the country in which they had resident status, so they were uh, legally able to be in that country or citizenship or nationality of that country. And then, of course, now that everything is processed online, there's there's not that same requirement legislatively. However, most of the time, they want you to send that passport to the visa application center that's responsible for processing for that geographic range of where you are. And the practical reason for that is you need to get your passport back and you're going to be sitting in a country until you get your passport back. Yeah. All right. Next question. This one's from 5411 TV. Oh, that's intriguing. Uh, hi, Mark. I have a STEM foreign work experience from 2014 to December, 2016. Okay, why is he telling this guys? Because only the last 10 years are eligible. So getting a post-grad in April, will this experience help with PR if it's over 10 years? Because I still have to get Canadian work experience, which will take time. So for the purposes of express entry and for many permanent resident applications, um, you've got a 10 year window to claim that foreign or Canadian work experience. And from the date that you file your EAPR, if it's express entry, that's the date that counts. So it's not grandfathered in your work history if you're granted an ITA. 
Um, it's only once you submit your EAPR that then that work history is locked in on that date. So any work history that falls outside of the 10 year window immediately preceding the date that you submit your EAPR, um, it can no longer be counted as work experience for the purposes of express entry and on many of the PNPs as well, but it just depends on the program, but for express entry for sure. So yeah, it kind of sucks, right? And so, uh, and when it comes to the category based draws, remember if you're looking at trying to get through one of the STEM category based draws, you only have a three year window to be eligible for the category based draws, even though the work experience is only six months for that particular uh, category. But remember, you still have to meet the minimum requirements for the Canadian Experience Class or the Federal Skilled Trade Program or the Federal Skilled Worker Program. You still have to meet those minimum requirements, which obviously are more than six months. But to get into the category-based draws, it's six months within the previous three years. So uh, short answer, uh, you, it's not going to help you if, you if it's outside the 10-year window. Okay, we've got a question from If Tech, a, f a longtime follower. He said, I called IRCC to find everything complete in the tracker, except for spouse's medical. Uh, got added medical request to do a sputum and x-ray. Your thoughts? When to renew the passport, now or after the medicals? If so, then how? So, Alicia, lots of people run into this when their applications are kind of delayed um, they can't or their country doesn't let them renew their passport when it's three years old, you know, to expiry. Uh, what do you advise people when their passports are nearing expiry and their peer application is kind of in the last stages? Yeah, and this is where it, it becomes a judgment call. And of course, if it's legal advice, we need to get more information from people about what are all the moving parts in their their lives in their families' lives right now. Um, so of course we can't give immigration legal advice. We can just give some information, but of course you need to make sure that you have a valid passport when it comes time to do your landing. Um, so that's something that's gonna be required. And if you need to travel, then that's something to think about as well. Probably if they're doing a sputum and an x-ray additional request, they might have seen something on that initial x-ray where they're worried about TB. And so they want to make sure that, and it doesn't make you inadmissible if you had tuber tuberculosis in the past. It just means that often you're going to be put under medical surveillance. So you'll have to come back and you'll have to report and show that you don't have active TB and everything's under control. But with the passport stuff, I mean, it, it always usually depends on talking to your embassy and trying to get some timelines on how long it's going to take them to give you your documents back. Great, great answer. All right, I'm gonna, this is, uh, I'm gonna jump here right to Nettie's question. This is a great question. So Nettie says, for the purposes uh, of the parent-grandparent sponsorship 2023, I think they sent 20,000 plus invitations, but will only accept 15,000 complete applications. Does that mean it's a race to submit? And also what's gonna happen to the applicants that were invited? But, we'll finish it off here, but did not make the 15K. So Alicia, maybe you can tackle this. I think there's a little, you know, there's one real clear reason for this, but um, what are your thoughts on this first? And then I'll chime in too. Mm -hmm. So some of it is based on eligibility, right? So sometimes what had happened was because they're pulling from such an old pool of applicants, they're pulling from people who years ago were meeting the minimum um, financial requirements. And that was based on tax returns for the last three years. So if you were eligible in the pool in 2020, you had to provide tax returns going back to 2017 from CRA, showing that your family income um, the principal applicant who's sponsoring the grandparents or parents had enough money over those years to meet the, the minimum requirements um, for funds for themselves and their family members plus 30%. So LECO plus 30%. And then of course, there were some modifications during the pandemic um, so that people didn't quite have to meet the plus 30%. Um, but those financial eligibility requirements are there. And what probably has happened over the years is that you were in the pool in 2020, you were meeting the requirements from 2017 to 2020, but then maybe things kind of economically went downward and maybe you weren't meeting the requirements for 2021 or 2022. And so when they did the invitation to 
to ask people to put in their applications, it's possible that the reason that they're bumping that up quite a bit is people no longer are meeting those financial eligibility or possibly their parents or grandparents are no longer meeting um, the, the medical admissibility as well. So in short, although they say 15,000 is what they're going to accept, if there were more and they've already extended an invitation, it's highly unlikely they would say, oh, we've hit the cap. Now, it's always possible, but they're pretty much counting on the fact that there's going to be at least 5,000 of those invitations where, like Alicia said, people are no longer eligible for one reason or not. Maybe their family members even passed away. So there's a, a lot of different factors there. Okay, uh, Muhammad says, uh, NOC uh, 312, um, psychologist, do we need a license for OINP? What about ECA? Does IQAS acceptable? And uh, this is over on Facebook. So Muhammad, thanks for connecting in. Um, when it comes to the ECA, any of the designated educational credential uh, assessment agencies are totally fine. So IQAS is most definitely accepted. It's not just West that's on the list. So there are, uh, you know, any of those entities, if they assess and provide you with an official educational credential assessment and they're a designated agency, you can count it. When it comes to the OINP and psychologists, um, mom, but this is where it really comes down to the program that you're applying under. And if it's an employer driven stream, um, there is a very, very good chance that they're going to want to see that you can actually work in that occupation in that particular uh, profession within the province. And uh, you take many, many of the provinces um, across all industries, not just professional occupations like psychology, but even trade level positions. Um, you'll see, for example, in the BC PNP, they have trade, uh, trade programs. Um, and not all trades are compulsory. In other words, having trade certification in some provinces is is compulsory and you can't work in that occupation without it, but others are optional. Well, for the most part, with many, many provinces, um, if licensing is, uh, even, even if it's optional, uh, like the BCPNP, uh, when it comes to, well, I should say, if it's, if it's not, if it's optional for the purposes of working in the occupation, many of the provinces still want people to have that uh, professional license or the, the trade certification uh, because they want to ensure that the individuals coming in are, are really the, the cream of the cream. And I had this discussion with a client just last week uh, that we booked. Actually, no, what's today? Maybe it was on Monday. It's all a blur. Uh, but uh, we talked specifically about this because he wanted to um, work in a roofing job. And uh, he had a friend who had a roofing company, and this was the path he was looking for. And I understand many of you are trying to find any way you can to be able to stay and this individual just had received his postgrad and he was looking at a trade. And I looked and said, okay, well, for the purposes of express entry, that work experience is just fine. But for the trade program in BC, mm -mm, unless you have uh, obtained trade certification. So you have to watch that very, very carefully. And Alicia, I don't know if you had a chance to, to take a look and see uh, specifically, but I, I, if, you know, when it comes to professional associations um, uh, in, in, you know, for the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program, if it's a program where the person is in and it's employer driven within Ontario already, well, you can't practice as a psychologist unless you're uh, registered with the professional association. However, if you're applying through, say, and you've got a notification of interest because you have experience as a psychologist, if, if some crazy world it was on an in-demand list, well, then um, that, that I, I suspect it's not as important. But what are your thoughts, Alicia? Yeah, and I was just also looking up to make sure that, um, you know, the NOC 31200 is not on the list for the designated professional bodies for uh, the assessments, and it's not. But yeah. I did want to make the note that, you know, be careful, because if you are working as a specialist or family physician, so the NOC 31100, 31101, 31102, or a pharmacist, those ones you're not going to be able to go through the, the regular ECA organizations. You're going to have to get your credentials assessed by either the pharmacy examining board or you're going to have to go through the Medical Council of Canada. So just make sure that you're going to get the right ECA as well, in addition to Mark, with what Mark was saying with respect to making sure you can prove that you're eligible to be working in that capacity for the NOC that you're claiming. 
Perfect. All right. And uh, I'm just going to, this is kind of a weird question. People don't usually post this. <laughs> Kevin. Oh, here, let me stop this here. So Kevin says, um, hey, Mark, how can I donate some funds to you guys in the name of charity? Well, just to start with, we're, we're definitely not a charity. You know, we do this, you know, to give back. And, and our hope is that by sharing knowledge, you guys will trust us that you will get to know us and you'll say, hey, if I'm going to hire a representative, um, Mark and Alicia, they seem to know their stuff and, uh, and I trust their answers. I trust they're going to they're gonna really help me. And so then people will retain us. But from the standpoint of our, our little YouTube channel here, we do have a concept of a super chat, which does allow questions. You know, sometimes we have so many people that are connecting in and it's hard to get to the, your, your question to the top. But we do have a, the concept of a, a little super chat. And that's right here at the bottom. You can see here, show your support for Canadian Immigration Institute. So there's different ways that you can do it right on the YouTube channel right here. So you can go and check that out as well. All right. Let's keep zipping through here. Next question. Okay, time to pull up the crystal ball, Alicia. Surya says, when do you think the next STEM draw will be? Oh, man, maybe you can pull up the last yeah. rounds of invitations. So we had a French, we had a healthcare. Uh, let's see where, where we're at here on the previous rounds of invitations. So we had agri-foods. We had transport. The big one. Last last STEM was December. So, yeah, I would say it's probably time for another STEM pretty soon. We had transport, we had egg, we had French, we had healthcare, we had egg, we had French. So, I would say probably the next occupation or the category specific should hopefully be STEM. But, you know, they don't tell us they're not providing their rhymes what? and reasons. Alicia, I, I, I thought you had, I, I thought for sure. Like I thought for sure that you and Minister Miller here were on, uh, you had him on speed dial and uh, you know, maybe here, let me just try to give him a call. Let me just see here if I can reach him. He, it's just ringing. Minister Miller, pick up. Uh, sorry guys, he's not picking up. Okay, well, we'll have to we'll have to leave that for now. Maybe we'll try and catch him a little bit later. So, Alicia, what do you think? When the if today we received one yesterday, is there going to be a STEM draw today? Maybe within the next two weeks. That's my guess. <laughs> next two weeks. Okay. All right. So you guys hold Alicia to this. She's uh, she said next two weeks for sure. I'm I'm putting words in your mouth. Who knows? But it's fun to speculate. It is. All right, next question is uh, uh, Mikinet, Mikinet Systems. Hey, Mark, how often do they do provincial nominee draws or are those with nominations considered general? So I, I don't want to confuse what we're dealing with here, but um, uh, yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on that, this, uh, this question here? How often do they do provincial nominee draws or, or are those with nominations considered general? So, you know, it's been a while since we've, We've had one mm -hmm. of those. And it seems like ever since they started changing the system, so there was a big change in how the express entry profile platform was being organized once they put in the ability to have these targeted draws. And ever since then, they really have not had these CEC, FSW, FST, or PNP. They don't label them the same way. So now they are calling them either the general draw or the program specific rounds of invitations. And so when they do a general draw, anybody who's over the 525 should be getting that ITA. So if you have a nomination from your province and you are meeting the minimum eligibility requirements, you should have hopefully received that ITA. And obviously the provincial nominations um, are, are pushing the CRS score up as well. So 600 plus you know, you're, you're guaranteed to get a, an invitation to apply. But I am surprised, Alicia, that they haven't done more PNP. Uh, I am, actually. Okay, next here. Okay, we have uh, Betalem says, Hey, Mark and Alicia, it is, is it important to inform IRCC that one is traveling back to their country for a short period of time 
to complete PCC while their PR process is going. Hmm. And so, Betty, this one's going to depend upon your when you're traveling and when you submitted that EAPR, right? So as long as your police certificates were valid at the time that the EAPR was submitted, that's important. Um, but of course, especially if you have a, a PNP nomination and you're traveling back and forth, sometimes they're concerned about where are you when and are you still working for your employer if it was under an employer specific sponsored category. So um, yeah, definitely reach out and we can talk more about that if you've got questions. Yes. And uh, like always, we ring the little bell here and then all you have to do is slide over to our firm website <clears throat> and just click on speak to a lawyer right here. And while I'm here, remember you guys that you can access all these other resources right uh, from this link on our, our website. So we have here, we've got our blog, we've got the Canadian Immigration Podcast, and on the Canadian Immig Immigration Podcast front, we have a ton of different topics that cover you know, a lot of the most recent announcements. Um, it was quite interesting. The last two we've, we, we've released here are on the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program. And this was massive news for us, the closure of the Alberta Opportunity Stream. And they also created uh, the, the, new, um, uh, the new creation of the new tourism program. Well, before we hardly even got this one out the door, um, the, the, uh, the tourism and hospitality stream uh, closed. So it's, uh, you know, th they're going to open again for a small number of individuals, but boy, we race to get these topics out and immigration is changing. The landscape is changing so fast that sometimes before we even have an opportunity to get the episode released, there is, um, yeah, it, the programs close. But it was a big, big issue, um, the Alberta Opportunity Stream, um, because many, many individuals now are, when they thought for sure they had an opportunity, it's just slipping away. So definitely go if you haven't subscribed to uh, our Canadian Immigration Podcast. And, and our Canadian Immigration Podcast is sponsored by Journey Business Plans. So if you guys have, um, you're outside of Canada, whether you're a, a corporation, whether you are an individual looking to come in as self-employed or whatever it might be, these uh, journey business plans is really, they, they really do a great job. This is what they specialize in helping individuals develop business plans for the purposes of immigration. And it goes both to Canada, the U S they, they have a wide variety of things to so go definitely go check them out. And it's just J O O R N E Y dot C A. So journey business plans. And uh, yeah, they've got options, including immigration consultants and lawyers. They've got uh, special rates. And then I hope, I think it's, Holthe Journey 10, H-O-L-T-H-E-J-O-O-R-N-E-Y, number 10. Uh, and you can get, uh, I think, a 10% discount on the first business plan that you order through Journey, if you mention us. So that is Journey. Yeah, great, great company. I also want to uh, give a shout out, you guys. Next week on Wednesday, one week from today, I am doing a special masterclass for all subscribers to the Express Entry Accelerator. And this is this is the thing. Not only do you have access to, how many do we have right now? 68 individual lessons that go through every part of the entire Express Entry process, start to finish, as well as a massive module on mastering your documents that covers temp, you know, templates and, and sample documents and checklists and uh, just different tools to help you Make sure your documents are correct because, boy, never before have there been a, a process where you're applying to immigrate to Canada within our permanent residence streams um, that has been so cruel and heartless because the slightest variation you have with your documents, if it doesn't match up exactly with what they're looking for, they'll just refuse. So, uh, like I said, we are going to have a, a special two-hour from 4 to 6 p.m. Mountain Time on March the 20th a special masterclass. So if you haven't yet subscribed, get in, subscribe. You've got access to all of the, the modules, all of this on demand for life. And we're changing how we're going to do it. We're going to be doing masterclasses every two weeks for two hours. Um, so stay tuned and you can come back as many times as you want. And I always advise people, don't wait until you get your ITA to then subscribe to the course. Do it when you're even thinking about immigrating to Canada, because within our modules, it covers everything from the very beginning, learning the basics, how it works. If you're wondering, how does this work? Is it even worth me going through this process? 
Module one will cover that and module two learning eligibility. So go check it out. And lots of people you've seen through, um, through our live Q and A's will pop in after the fact and give us a shout out after they've gone through the course. But the masterclass is something I love to do. And uh, so we're going to try to do it more frequently. I used to do four hours every two or three months, but I think people need questions sooner. And so we're going to just consistently do it. And once you've subscribed, you're in for as many times as you want to come back to the, to, to attend the master classes to get little questions answered. And of course, you guys, those of you who are looking for a complete peace of mind, um, this is where we come into the picture. And so all you have to do, if you want to hire us to assist you with your application, you can just go here, you can click on book a consult and, uh, and, um, yeah, this is uh, this is what we love to do. In fact, I have another uh, another uh, meeting with a client this afternoon to to go over and finalize the their express entry application and uh, get it all submitted. So, just to get people up to speed with that. So check out all the resources we have: blogs, podcasts, this live stream. Uh, make sure that even on our YouTube channel, when you're going through, you can search. And and this is another feature that I, I think people realize exists. But the reality is when you go to our YouTube channel, and if we just go to the main uh, channel here, um, when you go here, there is a search button and you can find it on your handheld or otherwise. And you can literally type in whatever topic you want. And if it's something, you know, that we covered, especially we've got a lot of content uh, that's built up now. I, I can't remember how many total videos we have. 876, Alicia, that's crazy, um, you know, over the years. And uh, yeah, so go check that out. You can do word searches. And so if I say, oh, what about self-employed um, work? How do I prove that? So if I just type in self-employed, there's a couple right here, self-employed success story. How do I claim self-employed work experience? And even though this is five years old, this is the beauty of this, Alicia. Um, this is a person who did it and, uh, you know, she came on and joined me. Um, even though this was five years ago, the the content it's still the same. Express Entry hasn't hasn't changed what it takes to, to prove your self-employed work experience. So lots of resources and I uh, just want to make sure people are aware of all of those if they're unable to get all of their uh, questions answered perfectly. So, all right, let's dive into a few more questions here as our time is just racing by. Um, okay, this is from Lido and Lido says, uh, booked a consult with Alicia for next week. Okay. However, would like to get an early insight into how dun, 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 existing misrep issues with uh, other province affects the application to another province. So it looks like someone got into a little bit of trouble with some misrep, maybe applying to one PNP and are now wondering how that might affect if they want to apply to another. And we're dealing at a provincial level, but it's still up there where information sharing kicks in. What do you think, Alicia? Mm -hmm. And so, Lido, it is interesting. Um, you know, of course, the government doesn't tell us, and I saw another question saying, what happens with background and checks, right? In detail, tell us what happens. We would love to know, right? We would love to know exactly which government agencies are sharing which information um, provincially with ESDC, so, so, so social insurance numbers maybe, and tracking with, um, looking at ends of work in terms of when companies are hiring or firing. Um, there might be, there are, of course, background security checks in terms of what kind of foreign offenses might be on the records. Canada, of course, shares information with the US and the UK and Australia and New Zealand. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts here. And of course, there probably is. So sometimes, even though they don't tell us, we have insights because people have booked consults or we have clients that come to us and say, hey, I got a procedural fairness letter. Hopefully it's not usually a client. Usually it's somebody has booked a consult. <laughs> yeah. oh, we haven't yeah. done the application. Yeah. Um, but they will say, hey, I got a procedural fairness letter and we're trying to figure out, well, how did they get that information? And it could be because of something you filed with your taxes. It could be because something that you filed with um, benefits if you worked for a government-based employer in the past. But provinces can share information if it has to do with misrepresentation or uh, integrity of the system or potential fraud. Yes. And so this is something where you do have to be very careful because um, 
what you say matters and what you've represented in a prior application. Everything is now digitized. Everything is now saved to the cloud or to IRCC's system once it's been inputted and once you've attested that it is true, complete and correct. So um, it is for sure going to be an issue if you've attested to something in one PNP application and then there's something else that's not jiving with it. I wish I knew who this was, Alicia. The countdown. Book your console, guys. You will not regret it. I did, and I am happy I did. And no, I am not getting paid to say this. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, countdown. That's very, very kind. And you know, Alicia, the, the, the internet is a, is a wonderful place, and it's a garbage place. You know, the, the hardest part right now that I'm finding is that there are so many people out there, so many voices, so much information that it's hard to really um, separate yourself from, from what's out there. You know, people watch these videos and they say, okay, well, yes, we're immigration lawyers, so hopefully that means something. Um, but there's so many people who go through the process, apply themselves, get an approval, and then consider themselves the expert. Then they create their YouTube channel or do whatever, you know, they, they want to and, and share their experience, share their process. And I can't tell you how often I see people just as much as getting their applications rejected, they get their applications approved because an officer used their discretion to accept something that maybe wasn't perfect, which is wonderful. But then that person will go and tell everybody else that this is the way you do it. When in fact, the officer probably gave them the benefit of the doubt and uh, if another officer was to look at that same application in the same way the evidence was presented, the documentation was presented, could come to a different conclusion and refuse. And so um, it's, it's really hard. So when people like The Countdown come on here and say, hey, I went and, uh, and I booked a consult, and I'm not sure maybe they were one of the, the people that have left a, rev a review for us here. Mark, um, Mark I'm going to add that The Countdown has another comment saying, it's Bree in Halifax. Good to see Bree! you. Ah, oh, that's, that's who it is. Okay. Ah, there we go. Thanks for pointing that out. It's Bree. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Well, um, the, the, the reality is um, this is the process and this is what Bree is talking about. And, uh, you know, we love to do this, you guys. Alicia and I don't practice in the area of immigration because we want our line our pockets with money. There are far more profitable areas of law practice for us to practice in. But we do this because we feel we can genuinely make a difference in people's lives. And more so than ever in the history of immigration, people are really um, running into a wall. And so many people are stuck now having a dream of immigrating to Canada evaporate before their eyes. And there are certain things that you can't do, um, certain things that you can't just manufacture to be able to stay. The rules are set, the requirements are set, and in many instances, the government themselves dictates who or how many people they want to become permanent residents. And unfortunately, the temporary programs have completely outstripped that the space is available for permanent residents. And now more than ever, people are having to face the reality that they may have to go home. And uh, that's why we encourage people so often, if you are in a place where you're really stuck, Come book a consult with us and we can talk to you about it. We can give you actual legal advice as to what the best options are for proceeding forward and allow you to have the information you need to make an informed choice because it's always your decision what you want to do. But we've just seen so, so much, um, oh, I hate that term, misinformation, so much confusion, um, so much, you know, desperation in people that, that, the crooked, unscrupulous actors are really, really exploiting people. And uh, when you come and you book a consult with us, one thing I promise with that consult is that we'll tell you what is really happening with you. We will not be afraid to tell you the stuff you don't want to hear. Like, you don't have a chance. You should consider saving the money that you would otherwise pay to someone for a faint hope of something and, and go home and rebuild your life and Maybe consider at a later stage when things settle down in Canada to come back. And we're not afraid to say that in the consults. We're not afraid to give you advice that maybe you, you don't want to hear. Um, of course, 
options we're going to present everything to you but that's the difference for us so yeah um, it's a hard area of practice but but we love it yeah and you know i never want to be in the position of giving somebody that bad news and and telling them look this is not the information or the advice you want to hear but i need to tell it to you because it is the truth and i've been in a number of situations like that and it's not an easy thing to do but I have to tell you the truth and I have to say the thing that's hard to say. You're not going to like my answer, but it is the information that you need to hear. So exactly. Here's a question, an express entry one that we get a lot of. It's some, it's an, it's a question that is, is covered and we discuss a lot in the course on a number of different, uh, you know, when it comes to the documents here, um, if we go to the document checklist, at least that we have here, the records of employment, in this lesson itself, um, we've got, uh, I'm going to point specifically right over here to um, uh, some of the tools. What if I can't get a reference letter? So we've created a, a resource right here that answers this question. And uh, Patel says, what do you suggest we do in the case of a, can of a Canadian employer is out of business and I do not have any way to contact them uh, for express entry reference letter? Can I still count that experience? And, uh, you know, maybe I'll tackle this one, Alicia, but um, the, the answer, Patel, is maybe. And the reason I say maybe is because there are so many different factors at play here. You're in a far better position trying to claim that work experience with a Canadian employer than you are with an overseas employer in some countries. But the reality is anytime you're diverting from what IRCC specifically requires for you to prove that work history, you run the risk that an officer uses their discretion negatively. And, you know, that discretion is a critical component to the immigration system. And, you know, I just finished a, a, a two hour um, uh, training session on flag polling uh, to lawyers and consultants through LPAN, the Legal Professional Education um, uh, Network. I did that yesterday and I worked on the border as an officer. And one of the, the, literally the lifeblood of the immigration program is discretion. And the officers can use that negatively or positively. And so there may be a situation where an officer looks at you, your work history and you have covered off everything that would have otherwise been in that reference letter through other means. Like maybe you have a job offer or a contract that specifically lists all of your duties. Cause that's one of the biggest problems with not having a reference letter is proving what you actually did. Or maybe you have a, a, an immigration, uh, maybe there's a work permit application that you submitted previously um, to, to, to get that. Like if it's an employer specific uh, job that details your job duties. Um, but you also have to show how many hours you worked, how much you were paid. Well, maybe you have pay slips, right? Hopefully you do pay stubs. Um, or you have your notice of assessment from CRA. Maybe you have some colleagues that worked with you that you could potentially get, you know, a sworn statement from. But at the end of the day, um, there's no guarantee that an officer will accept it. I can tell you that if you give the officer exactly what they need, if you include a complete perfected reference letter, and in our course, I have samples of you know, I, I think I've got about 30 different uh, sample reference letters here, all for the purposes of showing you that it doesn't matter what your reference letter looks like. It's the content. But in your situation, Patel, it may be possible. And as always, I tell people, you know, book a consult with us, um, subscribe to the Express Entry course and, and um, you know, and try to get as much, uh, as much uh, education and understanding about this as possible. Then do your best to pull it together. So I don't know if you have any other thoughts on on this issue because it exists for people who need educational di diplomas or degrees or they got burned up in a fire and the school shut down. You know, immigration repeatedly says, we don't care. That's not our problem. That's your problem. And we have 100,000 other people that would love to have your spot. So if you can't prove it, tough, right? That's the harsh nature of uh, express entry. And as long as you're telling the truth, right? As long as yeah. you are not making this up, as long as you have 
gone through and said, look, here are my tax documents, here are my payroll slips, here's a letter from my coworker, here is the contract that I signed, here's something on the website that I saved from when I was profiled with the company. Anything that you can do to do your best, but Mark is absolutely right, it depends upon the discretion of that officer. And sometimes it depends how you're using that period of work experience, right? If, if everything falls to eligibility on that one type of work experience and you can't prove it properly, that's probably going to be a much harder sell than, you know, it's just making up another couple months of foreign work experience. So there's a lot of factors at play and all you can do is tell the truth and do your best. Indeed. Okay, we'll finish off with, uh, with Sashin here. So Sashin says, I obtained an MBA degree through online studies in the U.S., completing the program in 12 months. The ECA recognized it as equivalent to a master's degree in Canada. Am I able or eligible to claim master's points in the express entry system, considering it was an online and expedited course? Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts, and Alicia? Sure. Yeah, Sachin. I mean, the same thing holds, right? Tell the truth, right? Provide them all the information because when you're doing your express entry application, it, it gives you more fields, right? It's not just what was the degree claimed, but it's length of the program, postal code of the program, where it was completed. And if it's an online course, you've got to be a little bit careful about where you say the course was completed and have some letters of explanation about where the school was and where you were. And if you have an education credential assessment and it says it's equivalent to master's, then for me, it would be reasonable to say, this is what this organization testing facility has found to be equivalent. And that's what I'm relying on. That is reasonable, but the the details of how you claim that history in your experience in terms of education location and what else you were doing at the time is also important. Yeah. Yeah. And people understand it can fall off the rails if you don't include exactly what IRCC has asked for. And uh, there's, I was reviewing a lot of federal case law um, over the last little stretch here, preparing for not only the port of entry, the flag pulling uh, session that I did yesterday, but I'm working on this economic PR book and, uh, and it's amazing. You know, officers, if, if what you're presenting isn't exactly what they've asked for, they will refuse. They will refuse. And uh, yes, some people may slip through, but you need to be so, so careful. And, uh, you know, all this stuff, especially with, you know, how to prove that you've got the right documents, how you uh, confirm that you've got the right knock code or that your reference letters work or that your police clearances work or that your translations are done properly, which is another huge volatile area. All of that we cover in the express entry course, as well as obviously when we work directly with our clients, that's our job to make sure, you know, that we're, we're um, uh, ensuring that you're meeting the requirements and what, um, what express entry is asking for. And, uh, you know, I, I actually want to give a shout out. I modified my landing page and I realized at the end of a lot of my courses, um, people are always saying thank you at the end. <laughs> and so I went through and I was like, Wow. You know, that would actually be a good testimonial because I know most people look at this and they're like, whatever, Mark, it's all free online. Why would I pay you for, for an express entry course when all the information is free online? And I thought, well, you know what, what better way to, to let people know what this course is like than to actually pull them on? So I did. So I pulled off and you'll recognize some of these people uh, from, from the past. Some were just from the most recent uh, one that I did. Uh, but yeah, so I pulled those into the, the landing page. You can check those out. And I tossed on a little video that I forgot a client had sent me. Um, uh, well, they booked a consult with me but, and, and subscribed to the course uh, a number of years ago. And I think they were in, I think they were in Vancouver at the time. Anyway, so I threw that one up there too. So you can go check, check that out. I had actually seven or eight different little testimonials, but uh, I, I just put one up here on the course, but you guys can, can go check that out. And uh, yeah, it's all here. Um, and there's individual lessons, video instructions on everything. And once again, it, uh, the master class will be a two hour session where we answer everything. And there's also a community group. When you're uh, subscribed, you are added into our uh, accelerator community group. And uh, every once in a while I jump on and I actually host these master classes in that group. So definitely consider that. And there's a link in the description. All right, Alicia, I don't know. Are there any other questions? Usually we have our HIL strategy call, but Igor is in some intense law society 
uh, C-Pled training this week that is just crushing him. He was telling us how difficult it was. And anyone who says it's easy to become an immigration lawyer or even a lawyer in Canada, well, you talk to Igor about his journey. And Alicia and I know the challenging process we went through, let alone getting into law school, as much as getting through the uh, the actual bar admission process to become full-fledged lawyers. And Igor is close. Come June here, July, he'll uh, we'll go through his official call and we'll be excited to celebrate that with him. But he's got a real tough week that he's soldiering through. So yeah. any other uh, any other comments, Alicia, that we should address? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to pull up Booty Presetto's comment there. Is there any effect if we got permanent residence and moved to another province? And this is one that comes up over and over and over again. How do you spell and, that, Alicia? Booty. Uh, B-U-D-I. Is the there we go the first one? Okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yes, it's something that you always want to be careful of and mindful of. If immigration can say, well, you know what, you got your permanent residence, especially if you got your permanent residence because you were under a provincial nominee category. So if a province has nominated you because you told them in your application, I have an intent to settle in this province. And then as soon as you get PR, you turn around and you leave the province, it is possible that they say, hey, that's not right. That's not fair. You didn't follow through on your intent. You told us you were going to live in, I don't know, Manitoba. And then you turn around and you head off to Ontario the next day. So this is a situation where it's possible that they could do an investigation to try to take away your permanent residence if they think that you were untruthful with them. And so it's always something where have a real go at it. If you have, especially under a PNP program, if you've landed in a province and you've told them that you have an intent to stay there, really make an effort, right? Try it for a while and and try to get established, try to find a job there. And if you really, really can't, then there might be grounds for you to say, hey, that's why I moved to another province. Same thing with Quebec. Keep in mind that all express entry says, you know, you cannot be landing in Quebec under express entry. So make sure you know that. Absolutely. I've got one more we'll pull in here. (laughs) Usually we have our, our, like I said, our strategy, but Igor's away. So um, uh, Bruce says, how should I answer the question on the express entry profile? Once again, this stuff's covered in the course, you guys. Um, Express entry profile asking if I have a job offer. Is this LMIA job offer it's referring to? Bruce, yes, it is LMIA-based job offer, employer-specific, but not exclusively. So it also includes other employer-specific work permits, work that's done on those employer-specific work permits um, when an individual has worked for at least one year in Canada and meet the other requirements of, of that the employer has to to, uh, to prove that they ha- there's an offer of employment for at least one year after the person becomes a permanent resident. But yes, Bruce, very often, very frequently... LMIA is what they're talking about, in addition to this other exception. Um, and uh, postgrad work permit holders on open work permits, spousal open work permit holders on open work permits, who have employers that love them, that are offering them a job for life, doesn't count. So simple as that. And, and Bruce, I did a, a detailed explainer video on this. So that's up on our YouTube channel. I also have a detailed article about it. Can I claim work experience points? job offer points. Um, This is all about the legal definition of arranged employment. And yes, Mark is totally correct. The simple answer is, if you are on an open work permit, you cannot properly claim arranged employment points. You are not eligible for those 50 points on an open work permit. So I go through, there's three different scenarios where you can claim those points properly and make sure that you understand what they are. Indeed. It looks like it's fairly popular, Alicia. It's got 12,000 views. Um, And do you see how I found it, you guys? Clicked on the search, typed in job offer, and that's what came in. So you can see we've got other ones. Is a job offer real or fake? Well, that was a fun one. That was a hot day when I recorded that one. I remember. All right. Anyways, so lots of uh, lots of content. Make sure you check that out. I think Alicia will wrap it up now. But thank you everybody for tuning in and joining us. We had a really group of uh, a really great group of people that were tuning in today. Um, and uh, and I do want to just finish off with one little thing. Um, Camby's world has been a follower. I see this for quite some time and, uh, people are frustrated. They are. And I get this. Uh, Camby says, Minister Miller, immigration hopes killer. You know what? Uh, I, people are free to express their, their concerns. And 
And in all honesty, I don't think anyone, not uh, Mendicino, not Fraser, not Miller, could have anticipated things, um, really could have projected the, the impact that, that it was going to have on individuals who were applying for permanent residence in Canada. You know, when Minister, Minister Miller, uh, Minister Fraser here, you know, repeatedly said, international students are the primary targets. They're the people that we want most. And, uh, and, and then he got transferred out and then Minister Miller comes in here. And so I wouldn't, you know, Minister Miller's done some good things and he's done some bad things, just like anyone. We all have. Um, but I wouldn't put all of this on the back of Minister Miller. Um, he's just unfortunately the person that now has to to suffer the brunt of all of the decisions that were made, you know, um, f- for the last 10 years, you know, 20 years. Uh, at the end of the day, I, you know, I've, I, I'm definitely trying not to be as critical because it's easy to be critical of people um, when you look at things in hindsight. And, uh, you know, I, I'll be honest, when Minister uh, Fraser, I was the, the national chair over the, um, uh, the Canadian Bar Association's immigration section, I had meetings with Minister Fraser, and um, you could see that he genuinely uh, wanted to do the right thing. And when we talked about, uh, I remember processing times didn't properly reflect what was really happening with express entry. This is through the pandemic and, and just a little bit after, you know, the main waves that were coming through um, processing times of federal skilled worker uh, program. Uh, they were still listed at six months when they were like 21 months. And, you know, we met with him. I brought this up and within a couple of weeks, he changed it so that it was really showing the real processing times. And so I think it's really easy for us to be really critical of people and yes, unfortunately, right now, Minister Miller is the scapegoat. So he's basically the, the guy who's having to give this bad news and to tell things like it is. And I'll be honest, I would rather the, the immigration department say, look, they're, not everybody is going to have a place for permanent residence here than mm-hmm. to continue to, to cause people to have a false hope or a false dream of being able to stay. And when it comes to the, the comment here of, uh, um, you know, of, of Camby, you know, immigration hopes killer. I don't, you know, I I just, I get it. I get the frustration. Everybody is free to, to express that frustration. Um, But understand it's, it's a complex issue. And, uh, and, you know, there's no doubt that people are not going to have pathways to permanent residence. And, uh, and you were completely free. And that's why I posted it and just didn't ignore it. People are free to express their frustrations. Um, and, uh, you know, and at the end of the day, hopefully uh, things will, the, the ship will get righted and, and we'll learn from, from this experience. But our hearts go out to you guys. My heart goes out to you guys, especially who've sacrificed so much to come go to school here, you know, legitimately, legitimately go to school, not just take some fly by night you know, um, one year program just to get a work permit, but someone who's gone through, done their education and legitimately had an expectation that if they spent all that money, went to a good school, did, you know, got uh, a good job after that, they would have a pathway to permanent residence. And Alicia and I, what we do is try to help you, you know, explore all possibilities uh, to think outside the box and to give you legal advice that you can trust so that you can make informed decisions. So, any other then, last minute comments, Alicia, before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, it was a wild ride being an immigration lawyer during the pandemic, right? It was like every single institution that we could rely on, that we've counted on for our entire lives, was shutting down, was crumbling, was not functioning the way it normally functioned. And governments all around the world were scrambling to try to deal with a whole bunch of people who were in the wrong countries, borders being closed, like it, things that had never happened before, they didn't really have contingency plans for. And because of that, a lot of people ended up getting their status extended and extended and extended in Canada. And for all those people now who are realizing how competitive it is for PR, I really do think that the one bone that immigration is extending and they're doing it based on forward projections of what chronic shortages are in the Canadian economy and sectors. And the only good thing about these kind of occupation specific targeted category based rounds is that instead of using backward looking data, they are using forward looking data and they're not doing things that are flash in the pan. They are looking at not codes that are always in demand over like a five or a 10 year time horizon. 
if you are looking at these category specific rounds, the one ray of hope is that you can do six months in any of these occupations. Make sure you're for sure getting paid for this job, that the job duties, that the lead statement, that your employer is able to write you this letter of reference at the end of the day saying this is what you actually did. You can build up those six months in part-time work in Canada, right? You, you don't have to necessarily do it all in one chunk. So I have had consults with people who were in a different profession, but they managed to do, you know, some pharmacy tech that added up to six months and bada bing, bada boom, they ha now have an ITA because that was the key at getting them into that category based round of, of invitations. So there are strategies that you can use. Um, don't give up hope, but you might need to modify your plan a little bit. One, we'll wrap up with this here. Uh, Carol says, how much is the master course and where can I get this master course? So every single video that you watch, it's always in the description. And so if we slide over here and you're watching on YouTube, if you look at the YouTube, uh, the YouTube page where you're watching and you go to the description below, you'll see here that the express entry course and master class is right here. And all you have to do is click on that link and it will take you right here to where you can subscribe. And when you click on the link here, it's 347, depending on, it'll automatically calculate tax depending on where you're at, but it's 347 US for the course. And remember with that course, um, it includes master classes that are going to be happening every two weeks that you'll have access to for life, as well as all of the course material. And uh, the reality is people have been subscribing to this course. I think this is the fourth, or fifth version, I started back in 2015 and I just keep updating it, updating it. And everybody who subscribes even back in 2015 is grandfathered into the new one. So you tell me what software subscription service <laughs> gives you uh, updates and access, free access to every update. And this one, the Express Entry Accelerator 2024 is not even an update, you guys. I wouldn't call it an update it because I recreated every single video, every lesson, all from scratch. So this is the most up-to-date version and everybody gets access to it as well as the, the community group. So, all right, that's, uh, I think we've talked about that enough. Um, we're here to help you guys in any way, as you can see. Thanks everybody for tuning in and joining. And uh, if we weren't able to get to your question, remember that you can book a consult with us. We'll be back at it again next week. And uh, I'll probably jump on one more time this week just to chat about a few things and and do some surprise uh, Q and A's. It all depends on the stamina that I have because I'm uh, a little fatigued these days. There's lots been going on in the healthy home, weddings and kids off to school and elderly parents in, in you know, uh, with health concerns and, and all these kinds of things. But uh, we just wanna let you know how much we appreciate you watching. Um, encourage you to, to like what you see and subscribe to our channel, uh, wherever you're watching it. And uh, yeah, the positive feedback we get from you guys is the reason we love to keep doing this. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.